Okay, um, welcome to this afternoon. I'm not chairing this afternoon, um, but two announcements. Um, there's been a request to have a, a walking sort of uh, centipede or whatever it's called, you know, uh, so, uh, to, to walk to the uh, uh, Corpus Christi tonight. So the proposal is to leave from Churchill College Porter's Lodge at 1845. One of us will be there to, to walk and lead the walk. And then the second point is that there's a spare uh, ticket for dinner tonight at the Newton Institute that's going if anyone wants to rush out and pay £55 for that for the uh, reception now. So thank you. And I'll hand over to Anna, who's going to chair this afternoon. So, but in the meantime, it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, um, Alfredo Dayano, who happens to be a friend, also a former colleague from Kent. We abandoned those to go to Madrid. Anyway, long story. Um, but let's go back to business, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Alfredo to talk about the Bremen Hills ap approach to exponentially small asymptotics in kind of a joint. Alfredo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers of the of the workshop for the invitation, to the organizers of the program for the whole uh, Cambridge experience this this month, um, and uh, in particular, very many thanks to Ines uh, for a lot of hard work uh, in the organization. Um, so this uh, this talk is. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, not many new results. Um, so um, the idea that I had uh, was to, uh, to take this opportunity to uh, go through um, this asymptotic analysis um, for pan level one uh, using the Riemann-Hilbert and Stipe's descent uh, methodology. Um, so this is largely based on the several papers, especially one by Andrei Kapaev in 2004. So in that sense, it's not really new results. I just wanted to go through it. And I thought it would be a good opportunity also to present, um, to go over some of the details in this, in this steep descent method, because, well, uh, I'm not sure if, if, any, if everyone is, is familiar with it. And I think it's a, um, it's a good tool, not the only one, but it's a good tool to, um, for, for, for this kind of, uh, for this kind of, of work. Uh, so we've heard about several of the pan levé equations uh, in this workshop and also during the, the program. And uh, probably pan levé one is uh, one that has appeared, uh, has appeared very often. Uh, so this is, you probably know, uh, the form, uh, these uh, nonlinear second order uh, differential equations, uh, some important properties that have been, uh, we have seen before, the solutions are, in this case, meromorphic functions in a complex plane with only double poles. This is a very uh, classical property. Uh, there is no kind, uh, there is uh, lots of uh, complete misery here because there is no, not any kind of reduction to any classical special functions, rational algebraic solutions. You have, I mean, you really go into uh, pan level transcendence, even, the, the, even though the equation looks harmless, then you go into transcendental solutions right away. Um, but there are many properties um, that, um, that can be used. One of them is, for example, this uh, five-fold symmetry, uh, in the sense that if you have a solution of pan level one, then well, you can you can uh, you can rotate it and get well, not exactly the same solution. Uh, Nalini Joshi, at some point, it was, she was discussing the, which is a very interesting case, the perfectly uh, symmetric case where you actually rotate and you get back to the same solution in all the sectors. But in general, you just, well, you're analyzing one sector and you can rotate to a different, to a different solution. And this symmetry uh, leads to, and uh, at least in the isomonodromic approach, a natural division of the complex plane into sectors of angle two pi over phi. So basically you can restrict to one and then, and then rotate. Um, Okay, so there are no classical solutions, there are no easy solutions if you want, but there are distinguished families of solutions um, with long history. So all the way back to Boutroux in 1913, uh, 
he distinguished in a long explanation the, tr the truncated or tronche and tritronche solutions. Basically, you pick a, one direction in one of these two pi over five sectors, um, and you prove that there are solutions that are asymptotically free of poles in that direction. And then by rotation, you can, you can study in the, in the other sectors. Um, a more modern, practical uh, characterization was given by Nalini and, and Kitaev. Uh, the truncate solution, and this also gives more information because it gives you the form of the asymptotic behavior in this pole-free sectors. So that you have this algebraic behavior and then you have an asymptotic series. These coefficients can be computed recursively. And, um, and basically, the truncate solution will be one that has uh, this kind of asymptotic behavior in a sector of any sector of angle less than four pi over five. So two neighboring sectors of angle two pi over five. And the very, even more especially the tree truncate solution with this kind of truncated behavior goes over to all the sectors in the complex plane except for one where all the, um, all the monsters are. Um, so, uh, okay, the tree truncate solution is the unique solution with this asymptotic behavior in the whole eight pi over five uh, sector. So some important observations, this tritronke solution is unique up to this symmetry that you can rotate. Tritronke solution is unique. It's uniquely determined. Um, you can determine it in many different ways. That's one of the problems that I will come back to uh, later on. Tronke solutions are actually a one parameter family of solutions. So we, all, we know, probably know by now that this is, uh, this is true. Uh, this is an asymptotic uh, expansion, but um, it's, there is one parameter, exponential, exponentially small corrections hidden, hidden here beyond all orders. Okay, so it's actually this is not one tronche solution; it's a family of solutions depending on one on one parameter. Uh, and then you have, if you have two parameters, then you have the full, uh, completely generic solution of family one. Um, and the asymptotic behavior of solutions in the tronche family differs only exponentially small terms in, in these sectors. So you have the algebraic behavior and then uh, hidden there the exponentially small terms. Okay, so some asymptotics I'm probably forgetting uh, references and I apologize for that. They have this, the asymptotics of, of solutions of panel one have been studied in many different ways, many different methods and for different families of, of solutions. So you can, you can go back all the way to Gautreau you can do direct monodromy, so just comparison, uh, so scaling and comparison of this with, uh, with the equation for the Weierstrass elliptic function. That's what the elliptic asymptotics in the generic case come from. Uh, you can do Borel summation. We've heard about WKB quite a lot in this, in this program. Uh, you can do multiple scales. And the method that I'm going to concentrate on today, for good or for evil, is the isomonodromic deformation. And there is, uh, it was mentioned, uh, in the program, and there was a, a one seminar by Marcel Wonk. There's this recent paper of Marcel and uh, Alexander, his student, um, where they make a connection between the WKB and the isomonodromic approach, which I think is very interesting because, well, they, com they explore the two methods and they see the, the connections between the, the, how to describe the solutions, how to characterize the, sol the different families of solutions in both, from both po points of, of, of view. Um, so what I what I like to do is basically following the, the work of uh, Andrei Kapaev on isomodotomic deformation, uh, and see what how how the steepest descent method for the corresponding Riemann Hilbert problem works, and then well uh, this is for tronche and three tronche solutions actually. So one question for the end is, can you do this for the generic solutions and how? So this is uh, um, pending. So how does it work? You probably know, but uh, before I go into the crazy details, the main idea is uh, how you work with Panleve equations from this point of view is that you uh, get the, the Panleve equations, Panleve one in this case, from compatibility between two linear two by two systems of ODs. So you have a function two by two, psi, that depends on two variables. Lambda is typically a spectra of variable, and X is the Panleve variable. So you have these two systems with some rational coefficients, rational matrix coefficients, A and U. And uh, you take the first equation, this equation in lambda, and you formulate a Riemann-Hilbert problem. Which I'm going to show. Um, Riemann-Hilbert problem that you have to prove that, okay, it has a solution under certain conditions. And 
uh, what happens is that from the uh, from compatibility of the system, you recover the corresponding Palmevé Palmevé function. So in this setting, and this is very important, how do you how you parameterize the the solutions? So if you have you go to Palmevé one, it's, it's an ODE, so you can parameterize it with well, I mean, describe a solution uniquely with initial data, for example, boundary data. Um, you could have, if you do trans-series, for example, the parameters in the trans-series would be another way. Here is in terms of Stokes multipliers in this Riemann-Hilbert problem. And one of the, I think, difficult uh, questions and, uh, is to how uh, to understand, if possible, sometimes it's very difficult, to understand the relation between all these ways of characterizing the families of solutions. Okay? So this is not always obvious. And once you have all this, uh, Riemann Hilbert problem set up, then you can apply the nonlinear method of steep descent and you can, you can start making changes and deforming and, uh, and introducing G functions and all that, all that stuff. Okay, so uh, panel level one, in this case, this is, this is the system that you have. This, this is the, 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 two, uh, the two ODEs. And uh, the coefficients are quite simple. So these are polynomials in, in lambda. Okay, so this system has the only singularity, but is a irregular one is at infinity. All the rest, uh, the rest of the plane is, is, is fine, is regular points. And here you have this y and z, z, sorry, um, that um, leads you to Panleve to Panleve one. So actually you set this up, and then if you put these two equations together, you, you impose compatibility, then you will get some relations be for this z and y and that leads you to Y solving Panleve 1. So it's a simple system, but okay, the, the transcendental Panleve functions are, are here. So it's, this is a, um, a bit tricky. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you take the first system, this one, uh, and you set up a riemann hiller problem. So in one possibility, it's not the only one, one possibility in this, uh, that's what uh, Kapayev uh, did, is to consider this uh, division of the complex plane. Here we have the two pi over five sectors that come naturally from the uh, from the, the symmetries of the equation. There's an extra jump here, which is off diagonal, but that's uh, but all the others are just triangular. So you are in a Riemann Hilbert problem. You look for a function psi that is analytic everywhere except for this rays. Okay, this six rays. Uh, six rays, except for the origin, they are boundary values as you approach any of the rays from the left, from the right, it's positive, negative. Uh, so these are related, these two values are related by these jumps, S1, S2, S0, S minus one, S minus two. And this S, <coughs> this uh, S1, S2, etc., are these Stokes multipliers. They tell you how to go from a solution in a certain sector to one in the, in the neighboring, in the neighbor sector. Um, okay, and these are constants, okay? They don't depend on lambda, they don't depend on x. It's just uh, nice triangular, triangular jumps. And then you have some condition at the, well, any singular point of the equation. In this case, it's only infinity. So, okay, I put all the details, but uh, not all of them are important. You have some algebraic factor here. You have an asymptotic expansion in inverse powers of lambda to minus one half in this case. And then you have an exponential factor here with a phase function that is, that looks like this. And the whole thing is set up so that these lines are actually Stokes lines for this phase function, okay. or they go in the, in the directions of the, of the Stokes lines at infinity. Um, okay, so these S, S's are the Stokes multipliers, and it's actually the essential information um, to characterize the solution. So you set, you, you set up this problem, then you prove that the, this riemann hilbert problem has a solution, Unique solution, and then uh, from uh, then from from this uh, riemann hiller problem, you get a solution of Panleve one. Um, and how do you know which one it is? Well, it depends on the Stokes multipliers that you put there. And this is a very non-trivial uh, way to to characterize them. So, from the symmetries of the equation, there are there are certain identities for the Stokes multipliers, and this happens in all the Panleve equations. It just gets more complicated. So in this case, there's a five-fold symmetry. So actually, it's only five Stokes multipliers. And then there is another identity here. Uh, and if you write it down, and uh, you, you, 
think for a moment, then you will realize that actually if you fix two Stokes multipliers, then you have all of them. And this is good because actually, well, you don't want five degrees of freedom in a two, in a second order ODE. It makes sense that this only two Stokes multipliers will determine everything. Okay? And this is in a way equivalent to two initial conditions, although the dependence is, is highly non-trivial. Okay? So where are the pan -Lebe functions? Well, the pan -Lebe functions are hiding in this matrices at infinity. So I put the asymptotic expansion here, I have identity, and then I have two matrices here. Psi one, psi two, well, this psi one and psi two, they contain the solution of pan level one with the corresponding Stokes multiplier and the Hamiltonian, okay? So everything is encoded in the Riemann Hilbert problem. Okay. Now, um, okay, so what do you do with it? Well, the first thing which is uh, non-trivial is to consider this case as zero equal to zero. And this leads to truncate solutions. If you ask me why, uh, I'll say it's a good question. My only answer now is that you do all the steep position analysis in this case and it works and it gives you the asymptotics for the truncate solution. So then you go back and see, well, this is the truncate family. Um, but to guess this from the, from the start, I'm not, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. But anyway, it corresponds to truncate solution, so and then you get rid of this jump on the positive real axis. This is gone, and you are left with this, with only the five, um, the, the other five, and actually using the relation between the Stokes multipliers, then S2 and S minus two are fixed to I, so this is fixed, and the only remaining uh, parameter is S1 or S minus one. You can take whatever you want, so I picked S minus one, and it appears in this jump, and it's the only free parameter that is left in your, in your uh, riemann hiller problem and in the pan equation, at, in the pan solution afterwards. Okay, so you take uh, S0 equal to zero, and then, well, then you can start the, uh, the, uh, the steep design method, which is, I wanted to give some details if there is, if there is time, and then down the rabbit hole, uh, actually, uh, I cannot promise that it's Wonderland on the other side, but okay, let's, let's go down the, the, the road. So the main ideas, if you are not interested in the details of steep descent, then maybe just take this message home. What you're going to do is a sequence of transformations of this Riemann-Hilbert problem. So you, you start going from one matrix to another one with invertible explicit transformations. Some of them easy, some of them not so easy. And the idea, what you want to get in the end, some of this, this is a long process that sometimes looks a bit mysterious, but the idea is that in the end, you want a near identity, I don't know if this terminology is standard, but near identity riemann hiller problem, which means that all the jumps that you have in the end are uniformly close to identity as, uh, well, it should be x, sorry, t will be related to x, so when your parameter is large, and the matrix, R itself uh, is identity, tends to identity at infinity. And in that case, there is a standard result in the theory of integral equations, that's one way to prove it. Then the matrix R itself uh, tends to identity as T tends to infinity. So you solve the riemann hiller problem asymptotically for large T or large X, and then you go back all the steps that are explicit and invertible and then you get the information about the original matrix psi and whatever you want from there. For example, these entries that contain the pan, -Lebe, pan -Lebe function. Um, so this is the instructions manual. Now the problem is how to, how to uh, implement it. And there are some ingredients here that um, are more or less standard. Um, and uh, well, this is, this is also shared with, if you've seen or done Riemann-Hilbert problems for orthogonal polynomials, a random matrix theory, some of this is common, but you have to be a bit careful. For example, the first important ingredient is the G function. And the G function, if you are working in orthogonal polynomials or in random matrix theory, normally has an interpretation that is describing the limit behavior of zeros of orthogonal polynomials in the large and limit or eigenvalues of your random matrix model in the large matrix size limit. Um, in the case of pan this G function 
does something similar, but is not, uh, doesn't have, a, as far as I know, doesn't have that interpretation, clear interpretation in terms of something. It's just a function that simplifies things. And it's very much related, and it's not a coincidence, with functions that you use when you do WKB. It's not a coincidence that what basically is normalizing at infinity and is basically what your potential in WKB will do, in a way. And then you have two types of approximations, typically. One of them is the global. You look for a global approximation everywhere except for stationary points. And in this sta at these stationary points, normally you have to build local parametrices, or at least prove that mm, things work. So, I mean, if you have a, an explicit local parametrics, parametrics is good, otherwise you have to um, be a bit, uh, bit more clever. And this is, uh, by the way, something that uh, Hadini was mentioning yesterday in, in her talk, where he was building local parametrices, explicit local parametrices for the Riemann-Hiller problem that she had. She was not doing asymptotics, but it's more or less, it's, it's, a, similar, it's a similar idea. And what is interesting here is that uh, these local parametrices, um, they are going to give you the perturbative and the non-perturbative contributions in the end. So some of them, some of the stationary points will give you, in this case, the algebraic behavior, and a different stationary point will give you the exponentially small collection. So if, if you can build this explicitly, then you have um, quite a lot of information there. Okay, so the first step, actually, this is not needed. Uh, but, okay, I, I put it here. First thing that I, I do is scaling. Um, you, can, you can ignore this step if you don't, if you don't like it, but okay, let's, let's take it. So basically you scale the variable, it's like if you have a, you're doing a steep descent of an integral, then you scale things to put the large parameter in front of the exponential factor, multiplying everything. That's one typical thing to do. And that's what you do here, you just put this, every, every fa any factor that I put on the left, is not going to change the jumps. You can check that, that if you multiply by anything on the left and you go, then the, this matrix and this matrix have, have the same jumps. It doesn't change. Um, so what this is going to do is, is going to change the asymptotics at infinity. So then I copy it again, is the, the factor that I had, then some series, and now the exponential, instead of having this, this, this phase function with x and lambda mixed, now I put this, this power, which is the one that comes out, uh, minus x to the power five over four. I'm assuming x negative, if you want. So we'll see later how you, what sector of the complex plane you can consider. And then this new phase function, theta zero, okay? Which is similar to the one before, but x is, is gone. And let me write, okay, probably I'll mix x and t, sorry for that, but let me write for sure in some, in some places t is this large parameter minus x to the power five over four, just be shorter. So that's the first thing, you scale, and now you have the exponential with your large parameter there. It also appears here, but this is, these are small terms. Um, okay, now this is the non-trivial step, is the G function. And um, okay, the G function basically, um, I'm not sure how to explain it. Uh, basically, well, the, the easy thing is that you, you put a, a, a function here, an al algebraic thing, that copies the behavior of uh, theta naught at infinity, then there are all the terms, but the first, uh, you, you want to, to capture the, the, the correct phase function and then something small in lambda. Um, and this G function is going to have the correct behavior when you do the deformation and you play the, the, the you consider the steep and descent uh, paths. Um, okay. So here's some degree of freedom because you can argue, and it's right, that this is not the only function that I can cook up that has this behavior at infinity. So I could pick y this root and this root, I could pick a different combination, and it's correct. That is, that is correct. The, the thing is that if you pick something else and then you do the steps afterwards, then it will break down. So then you go back and say, well, I need a g function like this, and then it works. Okay, so this is the g function. Um, if you change the conditions of the riemann hiller problem, for example, if you go to S0 different from zero, the full generic solution, then probably one of the things, well, I'm sure one of the things that you have to change is this G function in the analysis, definitely. Um, in any case, you, you replace this, the, the phase function with the G. And then, well, that means that the asymptotic behavior, uh, here you will have other coefficients here because this, all these terms, I mean, this is, uh, 
a diagonal matrix, and then it will put some extra, it will make some changes in this coefficient in this asymptotic expansion, but you can, you do a bit of bookkeeping and you, and you follow what's, what's going on. Okay, and then, okay, this G function has two stationary points. You can check, derivative equal to zero. One of them is minus two lambda zero, where lambda is one over square root of six, and G is zero at that point. And the other one is lambda zero, one over square root of six, and then the G has this value that people in Panda V1 will probably recognize, except for factor two, is the, the action that you expect in the, in the exponential, in the exponential uh, terms, okay? And then what you do is, okay, first a clever linear algebra trick, just split the jump on this, on this line, so you can write it as product of these two matrices, so you just split into two, and then you move uh, the contour, it was center at zero, you move one part to minus two lambda zero, and the other part to lambda zero. Okay, so careful with that, but the jumps stay more or less the, 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 way, the way they were. And now you have these four uh, prong things here around minus two lambda zero, and then you have these two contours around uh, lambda zero. And uh, in principle, when you do this, you redefine your function and you can introduce a new jump here. And you can check that in this case, there is no, there is nothing here. If S zero is different from zero, then there will be a jump here and then everything breaks down. But in this case, you can actually separate. And this is, and this is really important that you can actually separate this into two different, not two different riemann hiller problems, but two kind of um, geometrically, you can split it into two parts. Okay. Something else that I want to do, once I move this, then I have my asymptotics here, but I don't like this lambda to one fourth or minus one fourth. I prefer lambda plus two lambda zero because I move everything to the stationary point. Okay, you can do that, but then keep track of all the changes here, then another, iter another modification of these coefficients because you change the three factor here. Okay, small calculation, this is not too bad. Um, and then, almost the very last thing, you uh, remove the exponential factor in the asymptotics, but you multiply on the right, and you have to multiply on the right, and it's going to come in into the jumps. So, okay, there's no free lunch here. You simplify the asymptotics, then it hits you uh, in the jump matrices. And this mysterious triangular factor that I put here, uh, this is a technical thing, because I want the asymptotics, this, this algebraic factor, instead of multiplying on the left, I want it on the right. Otherwise, the final step doesn't work. You do it, and you get to the final step where you want identity at infinity, and it doesn't work. So you go back and say, okay, I need to correct one of the entries, and this is exactly what you need. And in this case, um, well, you get asymptotics, and then this algebraic factor now is on the right. Good. So this is a similar idea, this is a, it's a bit mysterious maybe, but it appears in other papers in, in, in asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials and random matrix theory, very particularly when, when people need a specific family of solutions of some Panleve equation. With some very particular properties, then typically you will need some extra factor to, to really, uh, basically to move the, the one, fa one, one algebraic factor from one side to the other, because otherwise it won't work. Okay, so this is the S matrix. So we have psi to five to five tilde to S, and S has these jumps. Okay, this looks like a mess, but the good thing is that um, if, you, if, if, if everything works, <clears throat> this G function is going to enter here in exponential terms, except for this one on the negative real axis. Um, but uh, if everything works, you can check if your G function is correct, then these exponential factors will go to zero in the corresponding direction. So you can see there's positive and negative exponential. So this is exactly to match the sign of the real part of G, positive or negative. So all these, all these jumps on these contours as you go away to infinity, they will tend to identity. If this, does, if this is not the case, then well, back and, and change things because something is wrong. Um, but in this case, the G function, uh, you, can, you can think of it in, in that way, you, in the end, you are going to, you, you want it in the jumps, and you want the right 
behavior of the real part. That gives you a hint of what kind of function to look for as well. Okay, and then what do you do? Well, everything tends to identity as t tends to, to infinity. Very good. Uh, the only problem is this jump here. This doesn't tend to identity no matter how much you try. This is. And, um, and there's a problem around the stationary point because at the stationary point, g is zero. So this doesn't tend to, uh, to, to identity. So I have to treat this separately and then the rays uh, in, a in a different way. So the, the negative real axis is easy for once. This is the global parametrics. So you just ignore everything. So you just take the jump on the negative axis with this jump, zero i, i zero, very standard problem, very standard asymptotics, and the solution for once is direct, okay? And this is exactly the algebraic factor that, um, that, that I wanted, okay? That's why I changed from lambda to lambda plus two lambda zero as well, to match with the global. Okay, global, fine. And then in the neighborhood of the stationary point, you construct a local parametrics. And that's usually the big headache because you have to identify or know or guess or pray that the local parametrics is something you know or you can construct explicitly. In this case, um, in this case it works. So you put local parametrics the same jumps as the S matrix and you want to match with the global on the boundary. And then, okay, standard things that would take too long, make constant jumps inside. Then the local parametrics is, looks mysterious, but it's a, an uh, analytic factor. And then every function. Okay, you could guess. So this is not surprising because if you have done a bit of this, uh, you see this four ray structure and the local behavior of, of G. And you can see, okay, I can make one I, one, one I, one, one I, one, zero. This is airy, basically. I mean, you have to manipulate a little bit, but this is a local, an airy local riemann hiller problem. Okay, so you have everything in terms of, of airy, and then basically you put the two things together. Now, the Tritron case, let me, let me go in, in steps. So I had S0 equal to zero, and then let me put S minus one equal to zero as well. So if I go to this reduced case, then what happens is that all the jump here disappears because the, the jump here was with S1, <coughs> S minus one and S minus one, so this goes away. And in this case, I only have this final contour. Okay, I removed the jump here with the global parametrics, I removed the jumps inside with the local parametrics, and I have the rays, and on the rays, the jumps are even more complicated, but if you look carefully, the dependence on t is only in exponential factors. And the exponential factors were there in such a way that they go to zero uh, in, 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 all of, in, all, in all these directions, okay? So these three jumps are going to tend to identity, that's good, and I'm left with the one on the boundary of the disk. And this jump on the boundary of the disk depends on the, log, on the, gl the global parametrics is explicit and the local one is airy function. So with asymptotics of airy functions, I have lots of information about how this jump, this jump works. Okay, so now everything works. So you have this final matrix that I call C. All the jumps are close to identity, exponentially close to identity or algebraically close to identity, but close to identity. And the matrix is identity at infinity. So it is identity plus corrections in T as T tends to infinity. And actually I can write a whole asymptotic series for this final matrix. And then I undo the transformations and then I get the large asymptotics of the original, of the original matrix. Um, okay, so this is a bit how it works. There are a lot of details that I'm hiding. Actually, you can get more information because um, this coefficient CK that appear in the expansion, uh, actually I can compute them if you want to. It gets more and more complicated, but they are explicit in the sense that if I have an, ex an asymptotic expansion for the jump, with some coefficients delta, then I can use this coefficient delta to, to compute the coefficient CK. And this is through other riemann hiller problems, not, not important here, but for example, if you want C1, C1 satisfies an additive riemann hiller problem with delta one. Delta one comes from area functions, you know what it is, how it behaves, you can solve for C1. Then C2 is a 
more complicated, but depends on delta one, delta two, C three, delta one, delta two, delta three, and so on. So it gets more and more complicated, but you can compute as many as you want um, explicitly. Okay. And what about the pan lebesgue function? So here's the problem. The pan lebesgue functions were hidden in the large T, large X asymptotic expansion. Um, so I need some uniformity, okay? Because I want to get these coefficients in the large lambda and I got asymptotics for large t. So I want to be able to say, okay, this is for large t uniformly with respect to lambda and then I can have access to these coefficients. And if you work it out, then the pan function and the Hamiltonian, there you can write it in terms of entries of your final C matrix. So if you have information about this C matrix, then you have the asymptotic information of the, of the pan functions and you get the result that uh, you get the, the coefficients that, I mean, it's consistent with, with what you would expect. Okay. Um, so there's also, uh, there's quite a lot of calculation here because you have this, this matrices C, you don't want to compute them explicitly because the calculation gets more and more complicated, but you can, you can see the structure of this matrices C from the area functions. So actually C1 is anti-diagonal, C2 is diagonal, C3 is anti-diagonal, diagonal, anti-diagonal. So you have, lots of symmetry there. And when you go to these particular entries, then you can actually, uh, you can actually simplify things, okay? Um, and actually, this exp expansion is uniform, okay? So every, each one of these CKs that goes with T, with T to the minus K is actually like one over lambda at infinity. So I can get the matrix that I want as a limit of this matrix as lambda tends infinity. That's how I compute them. And then you look at the structure of this CK matrix and then you look at these entries and actually the expansion is not in inverse powers of T, it's in inverse powers of T square, actually this, which is known that the expansion is in inverse powers of minus X to pi over two, not pi over four. So that uh, may be a complicated way to, to see it, but you can, you can actually get it. Okay, and then the last thing, uh, this may be a little bit new. If S1, S minus one is different from zero, then I go back to the final problem. And this is what I solved before with the C matrix, but then now I have this, this jump here because S minus one is different from zero, so this jump is still there. Um, this is exponentially small with respect to what you get here, which is what you expect. This contribution is going to be exponentially small, and then normally what you would do in orthogonal polynomials in random matrix theory in pan -Levé, just prove that it's exponentially small and you throw it away, okay? Um, which is fine. Um, the question is, uh, maybe you can get a bit more information because this is actually a, a nice, it's an easy jump in a vertical line. You can deform it to a vertical line and it looks like you can solve it explicitly. Um, so as I said, typical thing would be use the same thing, the same solution that you had prove that the jumps on the, on the other um, contours are exponentially small and then throw it away because you are interested in the, in the expansion in inverse powers of X. Uh, question is what if you don't throw it, don't throw it away all the exponentially small jumps? And um, in this case, you can actually build another local parametrics in, in, the other, in the neighborhood of the other stationary points. So this is something that is, was not done in the paper of K5, although I'm pretty sure that he knew how to how to work it out. It's just that normally you estimate exponentially small and you throw it away. Um, so in, the, in that case, the second local parametrics, if you look at the local behavior, you have this G0. So G is G0, this constant here, and then you have quadratic. And then again, okay, you go to the uh, literature and this local behavior, quadratic, and then you have a jump on a vertical line this can actually be solved now with another local parametrics. Instead of area function, this is with the complementary error function. Or parabolic cylinder, but it's a very just trivial case, almost trivial case of the parabolic cylinder uh, function. This, this we used in, in other problems related to orthogonal polynomials and, and, um, and random matrix theory. So you can build this, this one, and then you can, um, you can construct a final, final solution which is, uh, well, the S matrix then divided by the global outside, divided by the 
local p here and divided by the local q here. So you just have two local parameters. Um, and then you have to argue, okay, all the jumps go to identity as, as t tends to infinity. All these jumps are fine. And then you are left with jumps on the boundary. And actually, yeah, jumps on the boundary. <coughs> this one's in terms of expansion of area, this in terms of expansion of complementary error. But in everything is explicit. These are classical special functions. Um, and then what you do is you had your matrix for the three truncate case, S0, S minus one equal to zero. And you write the final matrix R as product of two and this correction matrix, chi, uh, takes care of, of, this, of this jump here. You have to be a bit careful because now if you make this construction, then you also have the C multiplying on the jumps. So everything gets messy. But all, this is, all these are explicit. This is uh, this C, you have an asymptotic expansion in inverse powers of T that you got from the three K case. It's just a matter of adding it and a bit of patience and, um, and it worked. And what you get is that standard argument again, uh, but what you have is this chi matrix. Uh, it's not just identity plus small. You can actually say, okay, this is exponentially small, this G naught, remember that it was a negative number. And then what you get for the chi is an, is an uh, asymptotic expansion inverse powers of T, and you also have this exponential factor here explicitly. And then, well, you have to put everything together. Now you go from R, you undo all the transformations, and you have to be careful with the algebraic and the exponential contributions and so on. Okay, but everything is, uh, is kind of explicit in this, in this local parameters. Uh, and what you get, this result, which is not new, is uh, in the Triton K case, um, you have this, this algebraic expansion of, uh, asymptotic expansion of the, of the Pandeve function, I call, uh, and, and Hamiltonian, I call them Y naught and H naught. Uh, so this is root behavior and then symptotic in powers of uh, minus five halves. Uh, and the tronche case, with it's only S0 equal to zero, then differs from the three tronche case in these exponentially small factors that are known that you can get also get from this, from the, the calculation of the steepest descent. Um, okay, and actually, well, you can compare, uh, this is the Stokes multiplier as minus one. If, if you can actually, it's not only negative x, but you can also consider x in a sector of, of angle uh, two pi and five from the negative real axis. And if you go the other way, then you have to play not with the S minus one multiplier, but with S one, that they are related. Okay. So you can compare the truncate solution with the three truncate, and there are different exponentially small corrections on one side and on the other, on the other side. So some remarks just to, to finish, because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, <clears throat> so you can extend this result for this, this, this sector in the complex plane. And beyond that, you have to be careful because then the contribution from the stationary point that was exponentially small is not exponentially small anymore. So that's consistent. And then you have to, uh, then you have to do something else. I mean, it's not algebraic and then a small contribution. Um, another question is exactly what breaks, because it has to break down, what breaks down in the generic case S0 different from zero? So if you start from the riemann hiller problem, you have this extra jump with S0, it was in the positive real axis, and then you immediately see that uh, the splitting into two parts doesn't work, and the G function should not work. Definitely you have to do something else. So you have to put a more complicated G function, probably instead of having just uh, one cut, which is what I put, uh, probably you need two cuts. So square root of quadratic or something like that. Yeah, probably quadratic or higher order. Um, and then we'll see what, how you start deforming. So the deformation should be, should be different. I mean, uh, from what, I, from, from what uh, we did here. And maybe the message here is that whenever you, I mean, in this methodology, whenever you have uh, local parametrices that you can express in terms of known special functions, and it's likely to happen in, in, other, in other examples, instead of throwing them away, um, if you can work it out, then that, um, that gives uh, explicit information of what these exponential, exponentially small contributions are. 
And there are many other examples in the, for example, paper of Itz Kapayev on, on Panleve 2. There are examples in Panleve 4, for example, and, uh, and, other, and other cases. So this is just one, one possible methodology. As I said, there are, there are other methods. And it's quite technical, but I think it's, it's nice in the sense that you get, clearly you get all the information that you expect from the different pieces in the, in the, in the statuses and analysis. Um, so I think I'm more or less done, and this is probably one message to take home. Uh, you don't have to use the method, but if you use it and it works, then it's quite powerful. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, are there any questions or Analysis. comments? Maybe I can ask one, so very nice talk. So maybe I was from this uh, technical point of view, and uh, when in your like the final transformation, you have several circles, right? And Sorry, uh, can, uh, is, is the microphone So can you show this uh, figure when you yeah. finish those kind of local uh, parametric constructions? And, um, you this, one this one or this yeah, one? Yeah, 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 this one here. So yeah. basically here, I think, you c now you get this uh, exponentially small terms, right? Yeah. And now for the remaining contours, they are also exponentially small, but they are, they are of an even higher order, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I think I got the. So, so yeah, it's exponentially small. Yeah, there's. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good detail actually. So everything is exponentially small, but yeah, some parts are more exponentially small than than others. So you have ma basically, it's true. You have to. I guess you have to prove that you can choose the the disks, in such a way that what you throw away here. Is actually is you can make it smaller than the than the contribution from yeah. the so from the other stationary point. So you have to be c yeah, as but yeah, you so have your like the algebraic terms comes from the circle near the minus two lambda zero, right? Then the other exponential one comes from the circle near lambda zero, the right circle, right? Then the other one are even smaller terms. Sorry, is it so basically you have two two terms, right? The first one is the algebraic ones. Yeah, and so I I, I guess it comes from this uh, uh, the left circle near the point minus two lambda zero. And then you have this uh, additional one depending on S minus one. Yeah. And it, it comes from this, uh, the right circle, right? And then the other ones are just uh, even smaller, so you can throw them away. Yeah, but, yeah but, I thi but I think you have to be careful because this, this yeah, but these factors, you have to make this, this disk large enough okay. so that this, this, expon this exponent here is smaller than the contribution from here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's, I think I think I, I think it works in this case, but it, but it's not it's not trivial to to see the the, the size of the disks. Yeah. But you have to be. It's an extra thing to be careful. Normally you throw it away and that's it. The the, the, the radius is arbitrary and that's it. Okay. But thank in you this case much. you have to be more careful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the remark probably kind of you know connection to 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 the bigger part of our audience. So in Riemann-Hilbert approach, there is, a, there is also, you can see the origin uh, of hyperseries. So if you start to iterate this part, um, or Riemann-Hilbert problem, start to iterate integral equation corresponding to this mm. exponential, no, 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 to, to the right, to the exponential yeah. small connection, then, it, then Neumann, Neumann series for the singular integral equation for this Riemann-Gerbe problem is exactly hyper-series. So it's going to be just create bigger and bigger exponential uh, squares of e A squared. So it was each term of the Neumann series for uh, singular integral equation for this for the Riemann-Gerbe problem is exactly hyper-series structure. So this is how, how kind of we can sort of come together. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, okay, we transfer, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just, so the first part, the first uh, it is e to the minus a, then of course you begin to iterate, it would be e to the mi minus 2a, and the whole tail of this, so this is, uh, so it is exactly shows that when you have linear equations, you have interval, contour interval formulas. No logic kind of, you know, you, you, just, you just have only one exponent. If you have non-linear, you have even Hilbert problem. And so integral equation, and this is how you really, as iteration, uh, it generates uh, this transceiver. Just, just remark. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? No? If not, uh, let's uh, thank Alfredo again. Thank you. Very nice talk. Mm -hmm. Oops, nice talk. And, uh,